into a time of worship, I invite you to come on in, find your seats and stand with us as we uh, enter into a time of worship this morning. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stay, when everything around me is shaking.
nothing left to say I come before you When nothing else makes sense I hold on to you
Sometimes the Lord just will wake us up in the middle of being in something. And that's true for me even here at church, and I was reminded of that last service. I was halfway through singing that last song, finally realizing the words that were coming out of my own mouth. Maybe you find that to be true many mornings when you're here. You know, the Lord's so gracious to us in that. Sometimes it's just not easy to enter into that mode. I mean, there was like a potluck happening outside. Then if you dropped your kids off and probably had a really interesting ride here. There's so much that takes place. And so even in my own life, the Lord can just remind me that it's good to be near to him and that he is here. And it must have been something in his plan as he led me to pick songs that this was going to be the next song after he woke me up last service. But this is just one of my favorite songs and such a wonderful prayer for our lives. Simple phrase, Lord, I need you.
just thank you, Lord, that that is a prayer that you are willing to answer. That's a prayer that you will answer, Lord. That you'll offer yourself to us, that you constantly offer yourself to us, and that when we turn to you, Lord, great to be with you all this morning. It feels like it should be like noon already, you know, just a weird time change of things, but we're glad that you're here with us. Welcome to Branches. If this is your first time, welcome. We're glad that you're here. Glad that you took a chance on a church that meets in a senior center, and um, it's a really special community, really, really special, and what makes it special is the people that are around you in this moment, so I just want to encourage you to take a moment right now and greet one another, say hello, introduce yourself, ask them how they're doing. We'll continue in just a moment. Branches Church. Everybody enjoy that extra hour of sleep. First, first service, I, I said that um, I don't think anybody enjoyed it more than the folks that had to set up today and the folks that cooked. So if we could just give a shout out for those people that made that. Please. My name is Kevin Carpet.
Psalm 100, verse 4, it says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you. Lord, we thank you for your promises. We thank you for your promise of your presence with us. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the many blessings you've placed upon our lives. And we thank you for your amazing provision in our lives as well. And I just pray that we as a community, Lord, can cultivate hearts of thankfulness, um, not just one day a year or one month a year, but throughout the year, Lord. And uh, we just appreciate for those, Lord, that you've put in position to make decisions with regards to the resources that you've blessed this church with. We pray you give them wisdom and discernment. So we commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn to the screens. Church. I'm Lisa Bryan. I'm the women's admissions pastor here at Branches, and I have a lot of opportunities that I'm excited to share with you today. First up, Serve City is joining with First Christian Church for their Thanksgiving food drive, providing pantry supplies for anyone in the city who might be experiencing food insecurity. So this month, we're hosting a special food collection, and you can find the list of food items on our website or at the connection table after service. As always, we ask that you please adhere to the list and shop for the same quality you would provide for your own family. Please turn in donations next Sunday, November 11th or the 17th. We won't be accepting donations after that date, so please be sure to bring everything within the next two weeks. It's a really great opportunity to be a part of this, and I want to personally thank you in advance for your generosity. Next up, I'm excited to announce that we're planning a missions trip to Ecuador to work alongside of our friends, the Vishers. The trip will be taking place the last week of April and will involve work on their water projects at high altitudes in the mountains of Ecuador. If you're interested in hearing more about how to be a part of this trip, please join us at the warehouse on Sunday, November 17th at 1230 for an info meeting. Please sign up for the info meeting at brancheshb.com. I want to know how many lunches to provide for you all. Okay, our annual Women's Friendsgiving is a great opportunity to come, share a meal, meet other women from our community. We're going to be gathering on Monday, November 18th at 6.30 p.m. in the Snooks backyard. We'll provide the turkey and ask that you bring a side dish or dessert to share. Let me tell you, in years past, we've enjoyed some delicious meals and laughter together, and we want you to join us. We do need to know how many turkeys to cook, so please be sure to sign up ahead of time online, and I hope to see you there. Lastly, our men's retreat is next weekend. Well, that came up quickly. We would love for you to join our men's ministry for a weekend away up in the mountains, growing together in your mission as followers of Jesus and having fun with fellow brothers in Christ. The entire weekend cost $180 and includes food and lodging. Don't miss out on the annual tradition for our Branches men. Sign up at brancheshb.com. Okay, that's it. Please join me in welcoming up Andrew Shea as he continues his series, Conviction. Oh, there we go. Guys, are you excited for this week that's coming up here? Election Day! Woo! Oh, a little bit, a little bit out there. Uh, you know, realistically, most Americans are not excited. Um, I was talking to a guy on the baseball field, one of the fellow coaches, and he goes to church in Huntington. He was asking me, he said, what's your culture of branches? Are you guys really invested in politics? And, you know, he's kind of mentioning that characterizes maybe a little bit of his experience at church. And, and, you know, I said to him, yeah, I'm really hoping that we can just avoid the extremes that I see in the evangelical church in America. It just seems like you know, there's one of two responses. Either we're consumed with politics or we just 
avoid it at all costs and act like it's not even a reality, it doesn't even exist around us. I feel like we're called to carve out a different path, right? Where we're not consumed. I want to be consumed with the things of the kingdom of God. I want to be consumed with the truth of the scriptures, but I also want to be engaged. I also want to be engaged in the real world around me. And, and so I just want to say real quickly, as a pastor, you know, this isn't from the Lord, this is just from me, that I think the Bible would tell us that we're supposed to use every bit of our abilities and influence in this world to bring about good. And that's good on the local level, that's good for the nation that we're a part of. And because of that, look, in a democracy, we are given a power. There is an influence that we have in society through our vote. So humbly, prayerfully consider how the Lord wants to lead you, and then I would say vote, participate on that level with that power and influence the same way you would in every other area that you have influence and power in this society, in your neighborhood and in the national level and everything else. But realistically, a lot of you are not going to be excited about that because I saw a recent survey said only 10% of Americans strongly feel that they have this sense of hope for the nation, for the way it's led for its government, only 10%. So, you know, there was like maybe one in 10, uh, you know, clapping as I talked about election day. A lot of you guys were quiet. We know how you responded, but that's okay. Because I'll tell you what, we should, again, be consumed with the things of the kingdom. I mean, my greatest hope has nothing to do with what's going on in government. It has to do with the fact that right now Jesus is king. And that's before the vote gets taken. And then guess what? A week from now, no matter what happens... Jesus is king, and his plans and his will are unstoppable for this world and for the universe. And that's where I get my confidence. That's where I get my peace as a Christian. I love when things are just going nutty in the country because I just feel like our times of worship are more important than ever. I worship my heart out because everybody is so bent out of shape and anxious, and we get to have peace. We get to have security. We get to have a hope. They cannot be shaken. So I just want to encourage you to lay hold of that no matter what happens this week. Let's open up now to Nehemiah chapter 6. We're in this series, Conviction. If you need a Bible, go ahead and raise your hand. One of the ushers will pass one to you. So far, we've seen in this series the unbelievable conviction of Nehemiah that he has shared with his countrymen and women. They have adopted this resolve together to rebuild the ruins of God's city, of Jerusalem, and they've faced verbal and physical external threats, and they've had to overcome their personal fears. They've had to learn how to operate as a society from one that was really focused on their self-interest to one that has God's interest at heart. There appears to be, at this point, nothing, absolutely nothing that can get this group of people off course when they have someone as dependent on God as Nehemiah at the helm. But just saying that, the enemies of Jerusalem, the neighboring nations, they also recognize that. So now their plan in chapter 6 is, Nehemiah must go. We got to get rid of that guy. You know, I had an invading nation in my kingdom here in Huntington Beach. I've got some experience with this. In North Huntington, uh, when we used to live there, we had this invasion of an Argentinian ant colony that's right. They, they, they invaded my 6,000 square foot kingdom, my little plot of land. And I did everything I could to get rid of those suckers. Try to drown them. Try to poison them, you know, with the over-the-counter poison that you feed them. They just get stronger. You know, you try to spray them. Try to do everything I possibly could. What did I need to do? I needed to eliminate the queen. Because if you eliminate the queen in an insect colony, it can't reproduce any longer. So this has been a great communal effort among God's people, but at the core, reproducing vision that others have begun to carry, it's Nehemiah. And the enemies of Jerusalem know if we take out Nehemiah and that reproduction of vision, maybe the entire project is going to fail. So enter here in Nehemiah 6, our usual suspects, the unholy trinity of Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem, these are the leaders of those neighboring people groups that encircle Jerusalem, Samaria and Ammon to the north and the Arabian tribes to the east and south. Here they are again in chapter 6, here to do everything they can to subvert the leadership of Nehemiah and attack this renewed community. And you're going to see, they're going to throw everything in the kitchen sink at this guy. Let's open up Nehemiah chapter 6. The verses will be on the screens. 
When the word came to Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies, that I had rebuilt the wall, and not a gap was left in it, though up to that time I had not set the doors and the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent me this message, Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. But they were scheming to harm me. So I sent messengers to them with this reply, I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? Four times they sent me the same message, and each time I gave them the same answer. Then the fifth time, Sanballat sent his aide to me with the same message, and in his hand was an unsealed letter in which was written, It is reported among the nations, and Geshem says it is true, that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt, and therefore you are building the wall. Moreover, according to these reports, you are about to become their king and have even appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. Now this report will get back to the king of Persia. So come, let us meet together. I sent him this reply. Nothing like what you are saying is happening. You are just making it up out of your head. They were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work and it will not be completed. But I prayed, now strengthen my hands. One day, I went to the house of Shemaiah, son of Deliah, the son of Mahetabel, who was shut in at his home. He said, let us meet in the house of God, inside the temple, and let us close the temple doors, because men are coming to kill you. By night, they are coming to kill you. But I said, should a man like me run away, or should someone like me go into the temple to save his life? I will not go. I realized that God had not sent him, but that he had prophesied against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. He had been hired to intimidate me so that I would commit a sin by doing this, and then they would give me a bad name to discredit me. Remember Tobiah and Sanballat, my God, because of what they have done. Remember also the prophet Noadiah and how she and the rest of the prophets have been trying to intimidate me. So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elul in 52 days. When all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. Also in those days, the nobles of Judah were sending many letters to Tobiah, and replies from Tobiah kept coming to them. For many in Judah were under oath to him, since he was son-in-law to Shechaniah, son of Ara, and his son Jehohanan had married the daughter of Meshulam, son of Barakiah. Moreover, they kept reporting to me his good deeds and then telling him what I said. And Tobiah sent letters to intimidate me. So as I said, guys, well, number one, this chapter is filled with great potential baby names. Can we just all agree on that? If you're thinking of baby names, you got got a mouthful right here. Great baby names. But it's also just filled with any and every attempt of the enemies of God's people to subvert Nehemiah. And I think it's worth acknowledging for the purposes of applying Nehemiah 6 to our lives, we've got to recognize we're all in a different context than Nehemiah, okay? I don't think this can relate one-to-one to any person's life out here. I mean, how many of you are the governor of a nation, you know, that's being attacked by a foreign nation? Your know, Canada's coming in, and, you know, you've got to hold your ground for God's people. That's just not happening, right? But as Christians, we do still have an enemy that opposes us in this day and age. And there are people, and there are obstacles that we will encounter that will get in the way of God's work for us in our lives. So let's reflect on the circumstances of Nehemiah 6, drawing connections with some of the spiritual opposition that you and I might face in this life. For starters, it all begins with Sanballat and Geshem feigning and faking these friendly overtures to Nehemiah. According to verse 1, as the community was just finishing up the work on the wall, all that was left to do, we got to hang the doors. We, you know, we got to hang up some paintings on the walls, right? You know, like if you're getting a house ready. Like they're right at the finish line. That's when these infamous enemies start sending Nehemiah these letters that, hey, we want to get together. And the suggestion is really interesting for them to meet up in the plain of Ono. It's supposed to be sort of this halfway point that's still in Nehemiah's lands, but just on the border 
of the enemy's lands. It'd be sort of like if Sanballat was the governor of L.A. and Nehemiah is the governor of Orange County, and Sanballat says, hey, Nehemiah, I really want to meet up with you. Let's meet up in the great plains of Seal Beach, right? It's still on your land, but, you know, it's right there up against the enemy. This meeting place is supposed to convey like a sort of meeting for reconciliation. And I can just see Sanballat saying, you know, hey, Nehemiah, Maya, Maya, can I call you Maya, Maya, buddy, Bobby, think about it, you know, uh, all the stuff that went on, the rumors that we're going to go to Persia, you know, and how I was going to attack you guys in the gaps of the wall and kill your people. Can we just say that's water to the bridge, you know, let's, let's just let bygones be bygones. I can see you have a wonderful entrepreneurial spirit. Maybe if the two of us join teams, we could work out a win-win for our two nations. Now, this overture of friendship is just a guise for a nefarious plot, for some scheming. And we have to understand, in our modern day, this is how our enemy, the devil, works in our own world. He's called by Jesus in John chapter 10, verse 10, a thief. A thief who comes to steal and kill and destroy. So does he announce himself as a thief as he goes about his thievery? You know, does he just show himself and you're like, I'm a thief and I have a plan for you that's going to steal and kill and destroy. No, a thief is successful insofar as their identity remains concealed. You think about scams, scams that are successful, scams by email. When people report about scams by email... It's 37% of them, they're being offered a sweepstakes. There's a prize that's gone unredeemed, and we worked so hard to find you. And now we finally found you through this obscure email address that we're sending this from. Right? And all you need to do is just click this link. And all you need to do is enter this information, and then you're going to get this benefit, right? The most frequent next to a sweepstakes and a prize is a job opportunity. So a scammer always is kind of guising the deception, right, as something that's for someone's benefit. I have never in my life opened my email and seen a scammer identify themselves, hello, I am the scum of the earth that likes to steal the identities of the elderly. And I look at the email address and it says, the captain of scamming at scams.com. No one has ever emailed me that way. They have incredible ways of concealing even their email address, so it looks like it's like an official Microsoft address or whatever. This is the way the devil presented himself as he opposed Jesus. Luke chapter 4, verse 5. The devil led him up, that is Jesus, to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you, this is for Jesus' benefit, right? I will give you all their authority and splendor that has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. So take note, our enemy presents curses as if they were blessings. That's how our enemy works in our lives. He will present curses as if they were blessings. The irony in this is God can often take things that appear to be curses and turn them into blessings. You know, things that seem really bad, God can redeem through His power. He can work out the good for those who love Him. But oftentimes the enemy will come to us with something that appears to be a blessing, but really it's a curse. The devil led Jesus to a high place. So also you might be led to a high place, success in your business. Oh, and you have all this success, and look what a blessing this is. Look at how much wealth this is yielding for me. And yet you become totally unproductive for God's kingdom. Oh, you think it's a blessing, but actually you've led this life of inconsequential interests because of how high you've been taken. It looks like a blessing, but it's really a curse. You know, oh, you're lonely, but then this romantic love interest comes into your life. You say, oh, I'll never be lonely again. This is the answer to all my woes that I've been living in. But that person actually leads you out of church community. Suddenly, your faith isn't as strong as it was before. Oh, this appeared to be a blessing when this person showed up in your life, but it actually it worked out to be a curse for you. Oh, you find that person, this person that fulfills all your needs, but you've forgotten you're already married. So here's this blessing. Here's this answer for all your woes, but it's going to mean divorce. It's going to mean you're sharing custody for your kids. 
Oh, this blessing of self-care. Oh, man, everybody in our society today, this is like everybody's favorite topic, self-care. So you build this perfect life of self-care, and everything is about caring for you, and that's good to an extent, but you just become consumed in it, as everyone appears to be consumed in it, and now you don't care for anyone except yourself. You're so blessed. You're so high, but you're so cursed because you're not good for anything in God's kingdom. According to verse 2, Nehemiah was clear-headed enough to discern immediately these guys are who they've always been. They're schemers. So he sends a rather terse and to-the-point message in response in verse 3. He says, I'm busy with something important. I can't be bothered to go up and meet with you and create this diplomatic pact that's going to give me more influence and power, whatever it is you're throwing in front of me. The antidote here, friends, that we see in Nehemiah to being thrown off course, off the course of God's will, is to know God's will in all clarity. If you're sure and clear-headed about what God's will is, you can't be tempted off that course. You won't let your life become all about success in business because you know you've been called to a higher purpose. You're clear-headed about what God's will is for your life, so you're not going to be steered in another direction. You're not going to embrace this romantic relationship that pulls you further and further from faith community and from God because you know that can't possibly be the right relationship that God would lead you into. The antidote for being thrown off course is being clear about God's will. You're not going to get sucked into this black hole of self-care that has no bottom because you know you are made to serve and to give and to contribute to God's people. Personally, guys, I've said no many times to ministry opportunities that would pull me above this work here in HB because God has called me here. He has not called me high. In verse 5, It indicates the next scheme that's going to be used by the enemy. It's this little coordinated good cop, bad cop scenario. And Sanbalat's going to be the good cop, and Geshem, who's really working with him, is going to be the bad guy. Sanbalat says he's heard a rumor that's being passed around, one that Geshem has confirmed. He's a very reliable guy, you, you know, that you want to listen to. That Nehemiah has rebuilt Jerusalem to prepare for a, a revolt against the king of Persia. And he's appointed these prophets, these spiritual leaders who are already proclaiming that he's the king over Judah. And all this is found in an unsealed letter. So this is an intentional leak of information, or rather disinformation. It's slander meant to incite fear from among the ranks of Judah Uh, that they're going to get this retribution from the king of Persia if this comes out because Persia has dealt with uprisings in this westernmost part of their empire and they dealt severely with them. So now association with Nehemiah is going to bring some of that hardship for the people. This is a reminder, guys. Our enemy speaks against us with slander. Our enemy uses slander against us. Slander is a common tool employed by opponents in this world. I would say with all the, you know, it's political season. Have you guys seen some of these ads? Oh my gosh, you're just getting barrage ads, 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 and ad, it plays again. The same ad plays again, it plays again, it plays again. I, like, I got the message, all right? And the message is rarely, this is what I stand for, this is my constructive vision for America, this is what I'm contributing to. No, it's mostly, it's like 90% about how awful and terrible their opponent is. Their candidate is. It's just slander, right? And my wife, you know, she was driving around uh, the city, and she was at a stoplight, and there was all these signs up with everybody's names. And she remarked to our kids, she said, oh, my gosh, you know, this lady's looking at these names. Most of these people don't even know who these people are. And my daughter piped up, and she goes, oh, no, I know who they are. That's the person that wants to set sex offenders free. And that guy got a DUI. (laughs) Right? I mean, my kids even are informed about this slander. The discourse has descended. Can we agree on that? We don't speak English anymore. We speak slander. That's our modern common tongue. So I want to take this moment to remind us, particularly in this political season, that the Bible demands we not employ our enemy's weapons. The Bible demands we not employ our enemy's weapons. Colossians chapter 3, verse 8, if we could get that on the screens. But now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, 
rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Is it unclear what the Bible expects of us as believers? It is very, very clear that we are not to slander. And and right, the definition of slander in our world is untrue, destructive speech. That's the definition in the world's eyes. But the definition through the Bible's eyes, through God's eyes, is not the world's definition. It doesn't matter if it's true or it's untrue, destructive speech. We are not to do it. We are not to participate in it. To participate in it is sin. And there is never a justification for God's people to engage in vile, damaging speech because it is sin. Look at Nehemiah. He didn't fight fire with fire. He didn't respond slander for slander. He fought lies with plain truth and overcame evil with good, as we are called to do in Romans chapter 12, verse 21. If you have a family member that is slandering you, damaging, vile speech, if you have a neighbor that's slandering you, like you've heard about the last couple of weeks with me, if you have a coworker who is maliciously maligning you and destroying you with their speech, let your defense be the truth and do not employ the weapons of our enemy. So none of these tactics of feigned friendship end up successful, and I'm not sure they really needed to be successful. I'm sure the relentless messaging that was coming at Nehemiah still had an ill effect upon him and his associates. In verse 9, Nehemiah recounts, they were trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work. So also our enemy seeks to overwhelm our will. It didn't need to be that Nehemiah took them up on any of these offers and they worked. They would just overwhelm the will of the people. And so our enemy seeks to overwhelm our will. Doesn't this happen to all of us? Sometimes there isn't just one thing that really gets to us, that just distracts us. It's the sum total of all the things, all the weight of everything that's going on that just adds up to one totally overwhelmed soul. Can I get an amen? Is this not the experience of anyone else in Orange County? Yesterday, let me tell you about yesterday. I'm supposed to be preparing a sermon, this sermon, and so I got to get up early to prepare this sermon, and I didn't sleep well the night before, and I got to tell you, I sleep like a baby, except when I have babies, but other than that, I I sleep like a baby, but that night, I just tossing and turning, and I'm hot, and I'm cold, and I'm having weird dreams, and heart attacks, I wake up, no, I'm good, you know, another one, no, I'm good, so off night, we'll just say that, and so I sleep in a little later than I want to, so I lose a little bit of prep time. But I got a meeting I got to get to, and at the end of that meeting, I got to rush out. I got to actually leave that meeting early. I got to tell them because I got to get to this volleyball game with my daughter. And if I don't come on time, let me tell you, volleyball games go very short for my daughter's team because they have not learned to serve over the net. (laughs) It's a very important skill in volleyball. If you cannot serve over the net, you never score a point. Games go very, very quickly. So I can't be late to the game. And as soon as that game is done, it backs right up to the practice that I've got with my son for baseball. So I'm thinking I'm going to fit in some prep time in the afternoon. But I'm already thinking, man, I'm not at my premium you know, mind space. I'm going to be tired. It's going to be less quality preparation time. And then when I get done with it, the next day I'm going to have a meeting. And i got three messages the following week. So this is where my head's at. I haven't even done anything yet. I haven't even lived a second of my day, and I'm already exhausted. I'm already completely tired from the inside out. And so many people in our world are paralyzed by this same dynamic. They're overwhelmed by fear. And it's not the fear of any one thing. It's the fear of all the things, all that future anticipated in the present moment. And we wilt 
What did Nehemiah do in this situation with all the pressures coming at him constantly, all the threats against his life impeding on him? Did he say, oh, I just need to get to the gym more. Oh, that'll deal with it. Oh, I just need to look at my diet. No, he needed to draw from the strength of God. He prayed, Lord, strengthen my hands, right? And I bet he prayed this day after day. I bet he prayed this night after night after night. Strengthen my hands. Handle the things I cannot handle. I can't handle it all. I can't control all these different things. Control the things I cannot control and give me the ability, give me the energy for now, the task that is right in front of me. And this is very similar to how Jesus teaches us to deal with our anxieties and fears in Matthew chapter 6. What does he say we need to do? When, when we're anticipating all the things of the world, he goes, think of your father. The answer is thinking of your father. Think of all the things he's handling all the time that you have no idea about. Know his good heart towards you. Put back in his hands all the things future, all the things extra that you don't have the capacity or margin to handle. And don't think about tomorrow. Ask for the energy to seek first the kingdom today, to have the energy you need for the thing that is right in front of you. That's what Nehemiah prayed, and so he was strengthened. So moving on, we see that Nehemiah, he faced not only curses disguised as blessings and destructive slander and this possibility of general overwhelm that is so common for us today, but in verse 10, it demonstrates he also faced spiritual deception. It's there that Nehemiah recounts how Shemaiah, son of Deliah, a prophet, reached out with this supposed spiritual insight. Hey, you got people coming to kill you. I've got this great plan. We can shut ourselves up in the temple so that you'll avoid death. And, and this is a very shrewd deception because Shemaiah is a prophet. This is someone who's supposedly speaking with insight that is coming from God. But what he's ultimately asking Nehemiah to do to avoid being murdered by shutting himself up in the temple According to the law, that's a capital offense. Numbers 18, verse 7, if you're not a Levite, if you're not of the priestly line and you put yourself in the temple, you're liable to be executed, right? So this is a very shrewd deception. At best, if Nehemiah does this, his reputation and integrity are going to be called into question. But following this directive, he could also be executed by his fellow Jews according to the law. So Nehemiah does not simply go along with it. Shemaiah says he tests the prophecy. And later on, he appears to uncover this plot that this insight from God has actually been paid for. <laughs> it's been paid for by Sanballat and Tobiah. So also today, we have to be aware our enemy employs spiritual deception. I know I say this quite a bit. I know I identify, you know why I say this quite a bit? Because the Bible tells us quite a bit. When you preach the Bible, you end up repeating yourself where the Bible repeats itself over and over again. So I, I say this often because the Bible tells us often we've got to test. We've got to test prophecy. We've got to test the words that come from supposed spiritual leaders because a lot of it is false. Now, the Bible is filled with genuine prophecy. It is prophecy. It is the genuine words of God. But these words of God have carried these stories, many stories of false prophets who carried false messages from God to oppose or intimidate or take advantage of God's people. In this case, what's driving Shemaiah's prophecy? He's been paid. He's been paid to give a certain message from God, and nothing has changed. I mean, we're thousands of years in the future, and there are still supposed spiritual leaders giving us messages, and their one motive is they want Money. Be careful. Be on guard. Be on watch. At the bookstore. Do you guys understand books? They're a moneymaker. So someone is selling books and they are going to yield payment for what they put in the book. That is a motivator for what they will say. Be on watch on social media. Oh my gosh, the new thing I see all over the place is, you know, spiritual leaders selling their leadership program, their Take your business to the next level program, and it's a Christian, you know, course that you pay $300 for, and you unlock all these videos where they tell you a bunch of lies mixed in with a little bit of truth from the Scriptures, right? Look, if half the videos are all these supposed spiritual truths, and the other half are these people flaunting their wealth, 
I just want you to throw up a red flag. Because wealth is a virtue in the world, it is not a virtue to Jesus. Wealth is not a virtue to Jesus. Generosity is a virtue to Jesus. But this is how we can tell whether the prophecy is from God or not. Does it accord with the Word of God? Are we getting a message where we're being asked to behave or think, or value something that otherwise contradicts with what God has called us to value. Nehemiah knew the law. He knew he was not allowed in the temple. Should a man like me try to save his life by shutting himself up in the temple? No, Nehemiah was going to be a man guided by God's Word, not the Word of any man or woman. And that's what we need to agree that we're going to be together. We're going to be men and women guided by the Word of God first not by any man or woman who claims to represent him. Reflecting on this situation, verse 14, Nehemiah again asked God to remember and recall the evil of Sanballat, Tobiah, and he adds the name of another prophet. I love this. He's not fighting slander with slander. He's saying, God, I'm leaving room for you to enact judgment and vengeance. But he adds to this list, remember also the prophet Noadiah and how she and the rest of the prophets have been trying to intimidate me. This makes it apparent that spiritual corruption wasn't just a little thing that was happening on the side in Nehemiah's day. It was not rare. It was commonplace. And we don't know the backstory of Noadiah. We don't know if she was paid. We don't know if she had a, some other interest in getting Nehemiah off course. But she was opposing God's work through her spiritual platform. So we can see it was the spiritual wild west in Jerusalem at this time. But I want to iterate that Nehemiah did not blame God for it, nor did he give up his faith. He did not, because of these bad experiences, throw off all faith in the faith. But that's what our enemy wants in our world today. Our enemy seeks to corrupt our faith entirely. He seeks to give our faith such a bad name that we would never believe again. Let me illustrate this. A, a couple weeks ago, I had a really bad experience at a restaurant. I didn't get you know, on a date that often with my wife recently, so finally we're out to dinner, and I order the prime rib dip sandwich. Yes, that's me. That's what I order when I'm out. And it says, you can have this while supplies last. You know, there's a limited amount that's prepared each day. So, you know, the rarity of it makes me want it all the more. So I order this from the waiter, and the waiter says, I got to check the computer. And checks the computer, comes back, says, no more prime rib dip. So very sad me. You know, we don't get this opportunity very often. Let me pick the second rate choice on the meal. I'll be satisfied, and I'm sad. But Ten minutes later, I overhear the table next to us. The man orders, yeah, uh oh, the prime rib dip. Same line from a different waiter. Oh, let me check the computer. Oh, come back. Oh, we're all out of it. Sorry, but let me go check in the kitchen. Goes to the kitchen, comes back, says, there is one more, and it's just for you. I'm dying. I'm dying inside. This is the greatest injustice that's ever occurred on the earth. When my waiter comes back, I let him know about the situation. I say, oh, this kind of stinks, you know. I, I ordered this thing, you know, just for future reference, you know, maybe check in the back. Guy hates me after that. Absolutely hates me. It is passive-aggressive behavior the rest of the night. And I get it, you know. I could have been the 10th guy who's like, man, I want what I want, you know, and like it's just terrible. But I'll tell you, it was a bad experience. Now, did I walk away from that and go, I'm never going to a restaurant again? I had a bad experience at a restaurant, never going to another one. This is what people do with the church. They have a bad experience in spiritual community. They say, oh, they're all the same. I'm never going to be a part of spiritual community again. How ridiculous is that? You know, maybe I'll avoid that restaurant. I probably won't. I probably will just maybe avoid that waiter if I get a chance. <laughs> but I'm still going to go to maybe that restaurant and maybe other restaurants because I can separate the two. You know, some people even go a step further. They go, oh, I had a bad experience in church community. I'm swearing off God. They give God the bad reputation. That's like having a bad experience at a restaurant and blaming food. You say, oh, I had a bad experience. I'm never eating food again. Right? What? Like, food is good. Food is great. You can't judge it based on the person who was serving it. Right? Man, God is good. God is great. We've all had, almost everybody I've ever met has had a bad experience in spiritual community and in the church. I'm super invested in church community. I probably have way more bad experiences than you because of how invested I am in it. But we act like a child when we have this mindset like, oh, I've been bitten by a dog. Every single dog is going to bite me then. That's childish. 
I want to validate the horrors of some of the experiences that some people have gone through, but we've got to grow up with maturity and differentiate. There is false faith and there is true faith. There is dysfunctional community, there is functional community, and then in an entirely different category, there is God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit who remain totally pure, who are worthy of our trust and faith at all times, no matter what our experience has been in this world. Nehemiah offered that full devotion in spite of spiritual corruption. And as a result, verse 15 says, quite unceremoniously, this isn't a guy who really pats himself on the back, that the wall around Jerusalem was completed in a record-breaking 52 days. And the enemies of God's people, they lost their confidence, meaning they fell in their own eyes. They felt a little bit smaller because they saw that what happened among God's people could only happen because God was moving, because God was empowering the nation. And you know, this is how these nations saw spirituality. They thought behind every nation, there's a patron God, and they judged the reputation and the power of that God based on the activity of the nation. So when Jerusalem is rising up, well, God is rising up in power. And I'll tell you what, thousands of years later, this is how outsiders will judge the church and Jesus Christ. When the church is active and seizes its mission in the world and becomes visible for the neighbors of this city, they will turn to Jesus They will say, wow, God is really up to us. People don't know what's true. People are just spiritual. They don't have a clue what's up. But when they see us overcome the corruption, when they see us not working for worldly success anymore, when there's no more deception and impurity, and we lay hold of the work, when there's a thousand Christians praying at City Hall for the work that God would do in this city, when there's thousands upon thousands and dozens of churches coming together for expressions of citywide worship, when we're united in a movement of neighboring that's going to serve our, our people around us, that we're going to give God glory in the public sphere rather than being tucked away politely in our little gatherings on Sunday mornings, they're going to see, wow, something is happening among those people, and they're going to give Jesus the glory. That's what the Israelites saw happen in their day. And then they rode off into the sunset, And they never had another issue again. (laughs) Forget about it. No, no, amen. In verse 17, this is anticlimactic. Following the completion of the wall, Nehemiah recounts that many of the nobles, the people of influence in Judah, were sending letters to one of Nehemiah's sworn enemies, Tobiah. Again, Tobiah, this is a Hebrew name. It means that Yahweh is good, and he names his son. Yahweh has shown mercy. He's apparently a Jew, at least by reputation, And he was obviously someone influential among God's people before Nehemiah came into town. That's what all these family associations convey to us. Through those, we can see that some of those connected to Tobiah, Nehemiah's enemy, those people were working on the wall. They were among the ranks of God's people. And here they are lobbying for Tobiah to Nehemiah and passing on whatever Nehemiah says back to Tobiah while Tobiah keeps writing these letters that are stirring up dissent. It's just a reminder that no matter how good things are, no matter how many accomplishments we arrive at in God's kingdom, there will always be someone or someones who come along the way to sow seeds of dissent for reasons that are their own. You can always count on our enemy utilizing friendly fire, friendly fire to oppose us from within the community. I guess the only way to avoid all that trouble would just be to do nothing at all. Then we don't have to worry about that. But that's not really a great way of accomplishing God's plans in the world. So as we consider friendly fire in the context of our own church community, just think, if Tobiah's agenda, whatever that agenda was, would have been accepted in the daylight, that's where he would have pushed it. But it had to be backroom conversations because his agenda wasn't right. It was of the darkness, and that's where it belonged. Let's agree to work in the light. If something is right in our community, it can be done in the light. If it's a healthy agenda, if it's a healthy way we're going to go about things in our relationships with each other, it can be pursued in the light. It's when the light is gone, that's when we're pursuing the things that are wrong. That's when we're pursuing the backdoor conversations. That's when we're promoting our agenda behind the scenes through intrigue and espionage. Let's agree to be a healthy community that leaves no room for the enemy because the work we do, we do in the light. We do what's right. Before we leave, I just want to put up 
our survey of how our enemy opposes us on the screen. And I want to invite you to consider, are you experiencing opposition, spiritual opposition through any of these means today? You know, maybe right now you're just feeling so, so blessed, but when you look at your actual life for God, it's just diminished more and more. Maybe that's actually a curse disguised as a blessing. Maybe you're getting brought higher to the high place, but away from the place that God has called you to. The answer is to know God's will. Maybe you have someone in your life that's just tearing you down maliciously. And your instinct, my instinct would be to fight fire with fire. But really, you're called to just speak plain truth and trust yourself to God and not employ the weapons of the enemy. I think a lot of us are just experiencing overwhelm. We've just got so many things going on that it's a total distraction for our soul. Before we even get going in the day, we're tired before we even started. You need to pray, strengthen my hands, God. Handle the things I can't handle. Control the things I can't control and give me the energy for now. What you called me to in front of me. Our enemy tells spiritual lies. Maybe you've signed up for one of those programs through Instagram and you're being fed a bunch of lies that are not going to produce the fruit of Jesus through your life and you need to cut off those avenues. Maybe you have had your faith corrupted You're here today, and that's a miracle, but you won't step in. There are so many people in church that are on the sidelines because of an experience they had 10 years ago, and they can't just revisit it and go, that was then, that was them, and this is now, and this is my God, and I'm going to invest. If we want to avoid the dysfunction of community because of the friendly fire, man, we won't do anything. Jesus had someone in his own band, and that did not stop him from fulfilling the will of God. We've got to have the same commitment to cut through it as Nehemiah. So just think about those, and let's enter a posture of prayer with the minutes that we have left and just offer our hearts to God for him to increase our strength and resolve. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, We want to stand in the promise. Greater is he that is in us, the Holy Spirit, your spirit, than he that is in the world, the enemy. You have given us everything we require to stand in this spiritual battle that exists in this world, to engage in it, to not back down, to not live a life saddled with fear, to not live a life every day overwhelmed, to not be discouraged by the difficulties that we face to the point that we step out And don't lay hold of your plans and purposes for us. Lord, we want to be people who are clear, clear clear-headed like Nehemiah was. He didn't lose sight of what your will is. And he went after it. And I pray that that would be us, our lives. We're just going to go after what you've called us to do. We're going to know your word so that we can filter all the false messages that are here to stir us off course. We want to be focused on what you have said. And let that be our daily bread. Father, my prayer for every single one of my brothers and sisters in this room today, no matter how they were coming in here, that they leave here renewed by your Holy Spirit, refreshed, strengthen their hands for the work that you have called them to. Strengthen our hands. We need to see you, our Father in heaven, who holds all the details we can't possibly hold. They're in your hands. You'll handle those. Lord, we're not built to carry the weight of all the future things that might or might not happen to us or that might or might not happen in this nation, God. You are built to handle all that. Give us the strength to face today and be faithful as Nehemiah was faithful with today. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me and... It's okay to get excited about the Lord strengthening us. We don't need more burdens. We need Jesus to lift those burdens with us and make us lighter. And that's a miracle, and God does it every day. If you need prayer, we've got a prayer team that's going to be at the front and the back. Maybe you just feel really oppressed. You just feel really broken down. 
we want to pray with you. This isn't us going through the motions. This isn't an event. This is a family. This is a church community living here in this area, seeking God's will together. Please be strengthened. If you need prayer, receive prayer at any time during this next time of worship. Let's spend our last few moments just praising our God and drawing our strength from Him. Extend your hands in a posture of receiving this blessing. I'm going to pray over us. Heavenly Father, give us the same resolve that we saw in Nehemiah 6. By your Holy Spirit, you'll give us the strength to pursue your will and purpose in this world for our individual lives, for this community here in Huntington Beach against all opposition. Lord, you will enable us to accomplish your plans and purposes. Lord, May, again, everyone who came in here this morning leave lighter, leave empowered, leave with perspective that is a gift of your Holy Spirit, and may we carry it together and continue to strengthen each other for your purposes in this world. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.